My guest on Straight Talk this week is Malcolm Pearson, leader of the United Kingdom Independence Party, known as UKIP. Malcolm Pearson, you were appointed to the House of Lords by Margaret Thatcher in 1990. Why did you desert the party whose leader gave you a seat in Parliament? Well, I felt I was still being loyal to Margaret Thatcher uh, when I left the Conservative Party. Uh, but she only lasted for a year after I was put in, and then we got John Major which wasn't the same thing at all. And in the end, I felt I had to leave the party because I'd given up hoping that the leadership, uh, the foreseeable leadership, um, would ever take an honourable uh, position on our membership of the European Union. And but Margaret Thatcher, although undoubtedly became Eurosceptic, of that there is no doubt, she's never wanted to leave the European Union. Well, I don't think I should comment on... Margaret Thatcher's um, pronouncements since she left office. But she has made it perfectly clear, I think even in her last book, that she felt deceived over the Single European Act. And she did vote with us and take a very active part in 1992 when we wanted to get a referendum on the Maastricht Treaty. But your core policy is for Britain to leave, seize its membership yes. of the European Union. And that is not something... Margaret Thatcher has ever espoused? Well, I, I don't want to comment on Lady Thatcher's views. Are I'm you afraid. saying that because privately you've heard her say she has? If she had said it privately, I wouldn't tell you what her views were. Well, had she said it roughly, privately? Not roughly or privately or in any way. So, so you agree with me? She doesn't, she doesn't share UKIP's policy of leaving? I don't know what Lady Thatcher's latest view is on the Lisbon Treaty and where we are now with the European Union. Okay. Why did you become leader of your party, of UKIP, uh, after joining it for only two years? It seems a, a sudden and dramatic elevation. Well, I have been very Eurosceptic. I've, I've known that this country, in the end, has to leave the European Union. Since I made the mistake of reading the Treaties of Rome in 1992, uh, which not many people have done. I'm just puzzled as to why you suddenly became leader of your party after only two years. Well, because at the spring, uh, there's a conference in Milton Keynes whenever it was in September, uh, Nigel Farage stood down as leader at, at very short notice. And um, because he wanted to, he got a big job to do in the European Parliament, he wanted to fight the Speaker in Buckingham, and he felt the, the load was just too much. So he stood down, which was quite a shock to all of us. And um, I then was... Um, lobbied by a number of people to see, asking me if I would stand for the leadership. Did you want to do it? Uh, no, not you particularly. Didn't. You I had was, to be dragged like the Speaker uh, to his chair. I wouldn't say I was dragged. I mean, it, 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 I, my initial reaction was, you know, I've never really been a politician. Um, I've got a distaste for the political class as a whole, although I have friends as individuals who are politicians. And I didn't want to do it. Um, but I was in the end persuaded that I should try to do it. Um, I should run for the leadership. And, you know, now I'm very glad that I did. And it is, it is a very great honour. But no other party leader uh, has sat in the unelected House of Lords since Lord Salisbury in 1902. This is 2010. It's not very 21st century. Well, I don't see why not. Um, in that sense, it's an honour, if you like. And anyway, I was elected to the Victorian honour. I, I was elected to the leadership. Uh, but there, there were some other candidates. It's a Victorian honour to have a leader of a modern democratic party in an unelected well, Lords. You may take that view, but we'll have to see what the electorate make of it. In, Indeed, in, in but is start. there a defence of it? We shall see. But all the main party leaders, Gordon Brown, David Cameron, Nick Clegg, they're all giving people the opportunity to back or sack them mm. on May the 6th. Mm. We have no opportunity to back or sack you. You're, you're in the Lords, whatever the result. Well, I hadn't looked at it like that. On the other hand, I don't think Gordon Brown was elected uh, as leader of his party. Uh, he just took over. No, I, 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 I agree. Back he's back of course, he's my point. Well, there it is. Perhaps I'm an anomaly. But, but as I say, we, we'll have to see what... But, well, I don't think this worries... As far as I can tell, I don't think this worries the electorate at all. Your party argues that... Nothing can really change in Britain for the better until we leave the European Union. Mm. And there is a clear Eurosceptic mood in this country, which I think is hard to deny. And a lot of the printed press is Eurosceptic as well. 
Why has this general feeling, almost of hostility at times to Europe, not translated itself into a, a higher share of the vote for your party? Because I think the, 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 the question of leaving Europe is always quite far down the opinion polls, and it's quite boring. Uh, Europe is remote um, to, to, to the people, and it was designed to be so. But the, the, the fact does remain that uh, uh, we say a large majority of our national law, and the government says a majority of all law affecting our business and commerce and all that, is now made um, in Brussels. And the people, uh, and the parliament is completely irrelevant from that. After the process of EU lawmaking, where the laws are proposed in secret uh, by the Commission, uh, negotiated in secret in the Committee of Permanent Representatives. I mean, all this is very boring. I mean, people are losing sure. me as I say uh, this. I, I mean, our House so of Commons library study uh, said it was less than 10%. Well, but that's because they included all law. Mm. Um, we're talking about national law. We're not talking about statutory instruments and street cones and local um, government legislation. The, I mean, the figure we rely on is, is that of the German government and, and the previous um, Germ, German chancellor. Given that that's true... And that, that is 84%. Right. Let, let, let me not argue with, with, with okay. that. Let me accept that for the basis of this argument. And given, again, this Eurosceptic attitude in Britain, all the more remarkable that in 2005, in the last election, you got 2.3% of the vote. Yeah. You had... 496 candidates, 458 of them lost their deposit, which means they got less than 5% of the said, vote. Yeah, I think the party concentrated too much then on the business of leaving the European Union. What we are going to do this time is, is to widen that debate and, and to show um, two um, key policies. I think the two key policies of this election are probably two areas of this election are probably going to be the economy and immigration. And we are going to lead on, on, on those as problems that you can't really solve if you stay in the European Union. And I say that because what the political class, if I may say, the, 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 the three failed old parties, as I call them, refuse to discuss, and the government and the, the, everyone has refused to discuss for years, is the cost of, of our European Union membership. Let me come on to that in, in, in a minute, and I, and I will. But if I could also, but I also, we, we're also going to discuss immigration, mm -hmm. because also um, the, the problem of immigration, of controlling our borders, cannot really be adequately done while we stay in the European Union. Isn't it? harder in the aftermath of a major global recession where this country has been reeling that in an age of uncertainty people don't really want to leave the EU. They, they may not warm to it, they may resent it at times, but they don't want to leave it. Well that is because there is a, a well-worn soundbite which has been used um, by the political class, by the three failed old parties for many years now and that soundbite has gone into the subconscious of the British people. And it, it runs along the lines of 3 million jobs and 60% of our trade depend on our membership of the European Union. Now they say it, it are linked to our membership of the European Union. And in doing so, they imply that were we to leave the political construct of the treaties of Rome, were we to leave the European Union, that our trade and jobs would in some way suffer. And this is, in a way, the heart of the economic debate when we're talking about the EU and our economy. Because, of course, it isn't true. Um, once you've withdrawn from the Treaty of Rome, otherwise you've repealed the 72 Act, what changes? Uh, nothing in our trade changes because, first of all, we are, if you like, the EU's, although it's not the EU, it's...